This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Daniel chapter number 5. Last week we were in Daniel chapter number 4, or a couple of weeks ago when we were together last. And Daniel chapter number 4 is an interesting chapter to say the least because it is the only passage in the entire Old Testament that is not written in Hebrew by a Hebrew. Chapter 4, of course, is Nebuchadnezzar giving his own testimony about what God had done in his life. And it's an amazing chapter. If you weren't able to be with us, uh, I think it's already posted on the church's Facebook page. You can listen to it online throughout the week whenever you want to. Uh, if it's not up there, it, it will be. Uh, but you can listen to it and catch up if you missed it. Daniel chapter number 5 is a continuation of those, uh, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, which as we pointed out in our introduction to the book, these first six chapters deal more with historical events that play out during the life of Daniel. The second half of the book of Daniel, the latter six chapters, will be almost entirely prophecy. So we've seen some prophecy already here in the first six chapters, uh, but now when we move into chapters 7 through 12, we'll see much more of that. But chapter number 5 deals with one of those historical events that is of the utmost importance to what's going on in the book of Daniel, both at Daniel's day and time and also for the events that would follow uh, Daniel. So let's dig in to Daniel chapter number 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Now right here we need to stop because we've We've just been introduced to a king that we've not seen before. Uh, hitherto, we've seen Nebuchadnezzar as the king of Babylon all the way up through chapter number 4. But in chapter number 5, we have uh, right away in verse 1 the introduction to a new king that we've not seen before. Uh, this king is Belshazzar. As we're going to see in just a moment, he's related to Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar has passed away at this point. The throne is no longer his. Chapter number 5, uh, based upon the best dating we can do from the events that are laid out and what occurs at the end of this chapter, this chapter was written approximately 66 years after Daniel chapter 1 was written. At least the events of chapter 5 are 66 years after the events of Daniel chapter 1. So that's quite a few years that has transpired, and Daniel and his Hebrew companions have been away in captivity in Babylon now for 66 years. That's quite a lengthy time. It's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, Daniel uh, and his companions, they certainly would have been young men when they were first taken into Babylon. They would have been somewhere between probably 15 and 20 years of age when they were first taken captive into Babylon. But this is 66 years later. So no matter how you add up those years, how old Daniel may have been when he first went into captivity, he's now in his 80s. So Daniel is an older man at this point. And for the rest of the book of Daniel, keep in mind, Daniel is an older saint. He's not a young man anymore. He's in his 80s. And uh, Brother John, hopefully he was in as good a shape as you are, uh, but he was in his 80s, and uh, he's going to continue to serve in the functions he's been serving. It's also important, though, because you remember before the children of Judah went into captivity into Babylon, the prophet Jeremiah had said that the kingdom of Judah was going to go into captivity to Babylon for a certain number of years. Does anyone remember how many years the captivity would be? TR? 
years? 70 years is correct. And so if this is 66 years after Daniel and his companions have been taken into captivity, you see that we're coming up very shortly on the completion or the fulfillment of that 70 years that Jeremiah had prophesied they would be in exile. So Daniel certainly knew what Jeremiah the prophet had preached before, uh, before Jerusalem fell 66 years earlier. And I'm sure all those 66 years he has to have been thinking that the day is coming when God is going to allow his people to return to the land where he grew up as a boy. But all those Hebrews that had been taken out of the land 66 years ago, they've all had families, they've all had children. After 66 years, I'm sure many of them had grandchildren. So there's at least one, maybe two generations of Judahites, Jews, who have been out of the land who never even saw the land of Israel, never saw the promised land. Never saw the city of Jerusalem, the city of David. Never saw the beauty of Solomon's temple. We have at least one, maybe two generations of Jews now who have been in captivity their entire lives. But the fulfillment of the 70 years is not too far off. All right, let's continue here. Verse number 2. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. So here we're told that Belshazzar is holding a feast, a feast of up to a thousand people, it says, a thousand of his lords. You know, Historians and archaeologists argued for years and years that there was no, no such gathering that ever took place among the ancient kings where they had feasts of a thousand or more people. And yet in recent years, in the 20th and early 21st century, archaeologists have discovered that not only the Babylonians, but also the Persians, who will come later, sometimes had be, uh, big feasts with as many as 1,500 or more people there at one time. So this statement that he has uh, a feast with a 1,000 of, of his lords there should not be uh, too big of a surprise to us. It's just another example of history and archaeology catching up with the Bible because we know if the Bible says it, we can just accept it as being the truth. It's also significant to understand what's going on while this feast is taking place inside the city of Babylon. Belshazzar was not the son right in line of Nebuchadnezzar. It says uh, his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple these golden and silver vessels. But uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a son... And I'm going to try to make sure that I spell his name correctly. Uh, Nabonidus became the king, and his son was Belshazzar. So Belshazzar is actually the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. You say, well, why does it say his father, Nebuchadnezzar? Both the Hebrew language and the Chaldean language of the Babylonians has no word for grandfather or grandson. If either language is talking about a grandfather, it simply says his father. If it's talking about his forefathers in general, like our American forefathers, he would simply say their fathers, because there is no word for grandfathers. So Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And again, up until the 20th century, it was highly debated among secular historians as to whether such a person named Belshazzar ever lived and was ever actually the king of Babylon because they could not find him recorded in many of the ancient records. However, in the 20th century, they discovered 
that lo and behold, his daddy, Nabunidus, while he was king, had been gone away from the city of Babylon, a warring, fighting against other peoples around them. And while Nabunidus was gone, he had made Belshazzar, his son, the temporary king of Babylon in his stead. So that while he was away, Belshazzar was supposed to tend to business there at home. The, the political and bureaucratic business of the kingdom. And also, of course, being away at war, there was the very real possibility that Nabunidus would never return home. And so by going ahead and appointing his son to be the temporary king of Babylon in his absence, there would be no problem with or question about the succession of who would become the next king of Babylon should Nabunidus meet his death on the battlefield. So records in the 20th century were discovered that Nabunidus, in fact, appointed his son, Belshazzar, for just a few years to be his temporary king of Babylon while he was away out at war. So that's why Belshazzar is ruling. His daddy's away at war. While his daddy is away at war fighting other enemies, lo and behold, the city of Babylon comes under siege by some people that had previously been under subjection by Babylon. Now, I'm not going to draw our map right now, but here the Euphrates River and the Tigris Euphrates, uh, the Tigris, the Euphrates. Over to the east is another land. Now this land right here, where the Tigris and Euphrates are, we've talked about it before, is the modern day country of what? Iraq, that's right. Just to the east of Iraq is what modern day country? Iran. Iran. Um, the ancient name for Iran is what? Persia. So to the east was a confederation of the Medes and the Persians. Now these are two different ethnic groups, but they are allied together for the purpose of rebelling against Babylon, throwing off the yoke of oppression of Babylon and gaining their freedom from Babylon. And possibly gaining more than just their freedom. But that was their goal, to break away and gain their independence from Babylon. So an army of the Medes and the Persians has been besieging the city of Babylon. They've been besieging the city of Babylon, and you might think that because they, were, they had the city under siege, that Belshazzar and those inside the city of Babylon should be terrified, should be worried, but they weren't. The reason they were not worried is that for nearly a thousand years, the city of Babylon had never fallen to a siege. You say, how in the world could that be? Well, that's for several reasons. First of all, Caleb, the Euphrates River flows through the city of Babylon. It literally flows under the walls, through the city, and out the other side under the wall. So there was a constant supply of fresh water. They didn't have to worry about running out of water. Usually in a siege, the city would succumb to the siege after a while because they'd either run out of food or water. Well, there was no chance of them running out of water because of the mighty Euphrates River running through it. As far as food goes, there, there was no chance of them running out of food because the city was so large it was able to supply its own food by growing food within the walls of the city during siege. Miss Mary? Uh, the city of Babylon is not in Jerusalem or in that area. No, ma'am. Jerusalem would be farther over here to the west, um, near, closer to the Mediterranean. And uh, so you would have Syria, uh, Syria and Jordan between Iraq and Israel. So it's farther to the west. But that's a good question. Because I remember we had to go through a little tight uh, space 
It came out on the other side. When you said that, it rang a bell. You may have visited the ancient city of Petra, perhaps. Were there cliffs on either side? Right. Miss Mary, that was probably the ancient city of Petra. Okay. You're right. So, um, the city was so large... It was 14 miles square, or 14 square miles. Let me get it right. Get my math correct. There's a difference between miles square and squared miles. 14 square miles inside the city walls of Babylon. Now, of course, there would have been, uh, there would have been lots of development and people living outside the walls of Babylon for quite a while in either direction as well. But just inside the city walls themselves... 14 square miles of people living and more than enough room for them also to grow the food they needed in order to wait out those sieges that would take place. So anybody that was trying to besiege the city of Babylon would eventually give up and go home because there was no point to it. There was no way to get in the walls. By the way, let me tell you a little bit more about the walls around Babylon because this is To me, this is one of the most exciting parts of the entire story in Daniel chapter 5. The walls around the city of Babylon were double walls. That is, they had an outer wall built. Then they had a moat that was just inside the outer wall. Then they had an inner wall that was built on the other side of the moat inside the city. So two walls protected the city of Babylon with a moat in between. I don't think they had alligators or anything in them. Maybe crocodiles, Timothy. I don't know. But but they had a moat. So even if you somehow got through or over that first wall, there was nothing but water and then another wall. It's practically impossible to get inside that second layer of walls. But let me tell you a little more about the outer wall itself. The outer walls were 85 feet Thick. Thick. How wide they were. From the outside to the inside. Now, I don't know about your house, but my house is about 60 feet in length from one end to the other. That means it would have been an entire house plus another half of my house thick. That's how thick the walls were on the outer wall. They were so thick that on the top of the outer wall, which ran... Uh, for, I believe, 25 miles all the way around the city. On the top of that outer wall, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus says that they held chariot races where they could race the chariots, four chariots wide, on top of the outer wall. You remember seeing that old Ben-Hur movie with Charlton Heston in the chariot races. Four chariots wide racing along the top of this wall in Babylon. That's a wide wall. The height of the wall was 350 feet tall. Now the average story of a building is about 10 feet. This would have been a 35 story wall that went all the way around the city of Babylon. You can imagine standing outside Babylon looking at the walls, and you can understand why it would seem so impregnable. No way you could get in or through the walls of Babylon. 350 feet tall. 35 stories tall. It makes Mr. Mr. Trump's wall that he wants to build look like a fence, doesn't it? They didn't have no immigration problem. That's true. A wall 350 feet high. It was said to have had a hundred gates at different places all the way around it. And every, uh, every half mile, I believe was the correct measurement, there was a tower built on top of the wall that was another hundred feet above the top of the wall. And there were hundreds of these towers all the way around the city. For protection and for for watching for the enemy too. That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. I, I would have to do some studying on that, Miss Barbara. But you can imagine 
an army approaching the city and seeing these walls. That's what most armies, in fact, would do. And if they didn't do it immediately, after six months or so of hanging around, they're going to come to the conclusion, we're wasting our time and our lives, let's go home. That's why the city had never succumbed to a siege in a thousand years. So even though the army of the Medes and the Persians were outside Babylon, Belshazzar wasn't worried in the least because he's inside those walls with plenty of water and apparently plenty of food because he's throwing a feast for a thousand of his upper class lords in the city of Babylon. But you know it reminds us, or it ought to remind us, that the world thinks that they are just safe and have all that they need without God too. But the world will one day find out that they were not as invulnerable as they thought, that they didn't have everything that they thought they needed. But here's Belshazzar. And in his pride and his arrogance, in thinking that no one can defeat me, no one can even touch me, he's throwing a feast while his enemy is outside the gates of the city. And it told us here in verse 2 that he had them bring to him the vessels of gold and silver that his, his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem 66 years before this. He had the audacity to do something that apparently not even Nebuchadnezzar had done. And that is take those vessels from Solomon's temple, the temple to Yahweh, Jehovah, Daniel's God, Bring them in so he and all those who were with him could drink and get drunk out of the vessels from the house of God. They were having a drunken party. And what more blasphemous thing could they have done than to use the things dedicated and consecrated for the use of God in the temple of God, have those brought out, out of the museum, and serve strong drink in them for them to party with. Apparently, not even Nebuchadnezzar had done this. They must have been in a storehouse somewhere among all of Nebuchadnezzar's valuables and his uh, expensive things he had taken from different lands. Because they had to be brought out of storage to be used for this purpose. My what blasphemy against God. Verse 3, Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. One of the things that I read in preparing for today said that it was unusual for the men and the women both to be feasting and partying together. Normally, the men would have met in one place and the women in another place. <coughs> so the, uh, the writer that was mentioning this unusual uh, fact was pointing out that there was probably immorality going on along with the drinking. And I would say there's probably uh, something to that. Verse 4, they drank wine and praised the, God of, the gods of gold and of silver of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. They were praising the gods, the false gods of Babylon. We spent a good deal of time in chapter 2 talking about some of the different gods and goddesses that the uh, Babylonians worship. We won't do that tonight, but they're worshiping their pagan gods, committing immorality while they're drinking strong drink out of vessels dedicated to the service of God. Verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the 
joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. So they're in the middle of their revelry, and over against the wall where the candlestick was attached to the wall in the plaster, a hand appeared and began to write in the plaster on the wall. Belshazzar, the Bible says, saw the hand writing on the wall. I don't know if anyone else there in the party saw the hand, but Belshazzar saw the hand. Perhaps the others may have seen the writing, but not the hand, or maybe they all saw the hand. Nevertheless, Belshazzar saw the hand writing, and he was so terrified that his, the joints of his thighs of his hips were loosened and his knees smote one against another. Remember seeing those old, uh, uh, the three stooges where they would get, Curly would get so terrified, his knees would uh, shake one against another. He was so terrified that his knees were literally beating one against another. T.R.? was one case or another because there's no way to know. But God was pronouncing judgment on Babylon as a whole, so it was probably everyone that saw the hand because it was a message to Babylon, not just the king, but to the nation. And the message of repentance, or repentance, but conviction and judgment. Well, T.R. saying that um, because God was pronouncing judgment on all of Babylon, likely all the people there saw the hand writing on the wall. T.R., you might be right, but remember God is also, He also deals with kings as a representative of His people too. So we don't know. I guess we'll have to wait till we get to heaven to find that out. Nevertheless, Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall. He was terrified and the hand wrote in the plaster. Another thing that I looked up this week in preparing for tonight's message, the, the plaster on the walls. We talked about the fact that he's there in this feast with, that he threw for a thousand of his lords. That doesn't mean they were all in the same room by any stretch of the imagination, but it has been discovered by archaeologists, I believe when Saddam Hussein was still in power in Iraq, that one of the former throne rooms of Nebuchadnezzar was unearthed, and the, the throne room that they found was 56 feet wide. There again, that's as wide as my house is long. And it was 173 feet long. That's one room in Nebuchadnezzar's palace. That was the throne room where the king sat. And folks, that's an awfully big room. You could go to the Hyatt or the Hilton in one of their huge conference rooms, and I don't know that it would be that big. So it's very possible that he did have all thousand of the lords and his wives and concubines in the same room there that night when the hand wrote on the wall. By the way, in that throne room, the, the, the entranceway is in the middle of the wall on the long side of the wall, and immediately opposite the entrance on the other long wall, in the middle of the wall, was a little place inset into the wall where the king's throne would sit. And when they unearthed this room, they discovered that lo and behold, there was still plaster on the walls in that inset where the throne would have sat, uh, that this king sat upon. So this was a wall that made of brick undoubtedly, but it had plaster covering the walls. That very likely was the room, the very room, where Belshazzar sat that night in all his revelry and saw the hand writing somewhere on the wall in the plaster. All right, let's continue on here. Verse 7, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. We've talked about all those groups before. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof, 
shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So he has all those same types of fellows come in that Nebuchadnezzar had come in on two different occasions to try to explain dreams to him. This is no dream though. It's actually written in the plaster. And he has all these wise men come in to try to tell him uh, what the interpretation is, what the meaning is. So we know that they could actually read what was written in the plaster. Whether they saw the hand write it or not, we don't know, but they saw the words in the plaster, but they couldn't figure it out. They didn't know what it meant. But he promised that whichever one could tell him what the saying meant, he would put scarlet clothes on them. Of course, a scarlet robe would have been symbolic of royalty. Probably one of the king's own robes that was being given to the person. A chain of gold hung around his neck, which probably would have not only been valuable because of it being made of gold, but undoubtedly because it would have been one of the king's medallions on the chain that was hung around his neck, showing that this man received this from the king himself. And if that wasn't enough, he offers to him the highest position he can offer him, the number three position in the kingdom. This goes back to what we talked about earlier. It it explains what the secular historians could not explain and falls perfectly in line with what we know that Belshazzar, while he was the king there in Babylon, his daddy, who was away at war, was still ultimately the king. He could not make anyone the number two person in the kingdom because he was the number two person in the kingdom. Daddy was number one. He was number two. So the highest position he had to offer was number three in the kingdom. It fits perfectly with the story and is perfectly understandable when we understand that Belshazzar was a king, but he was ruling for his daddy who was away at war. He offers this. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. He was, this was getting, getting to him, because he saw a hand right on the wall. That doesn't happen every day. Whatever it is that's written in the plaster must be important. But nobody can tell him what it means. My, what an awful situation he's found himself in here. Verse 10. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house. And the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. That's what they were all supposed to say when they started addressing the king. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. So here we have the queen who comes in and she said, there is a man in your kingdom who can tell you what that means. It tells us here she's the queen. In all likelihood, she is the queen mother. She's not his wife. She's his mother and possibly even his grandmother. It's possible she could have been Nebuchadnezzar's wife, which would be his grandmother, who might have still been alive at the time. 
But more than likely, it's his mother who's married to his daddy who's away at war. His, his mother, Nebuchadnezzar's wife, was the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. Whether it was his mother or his grandmother, they no doubt knew who Daniel was. We don't know why Daniel wasn't brought in with all the rest of the Chaldeans, magicians, and soothsayers, because he obviously was in the city of Babylon. Perhaps at this point he is in retirement, or he is uh, not, not in, uh, in um, maybe he's not performing the duties of these other men because he has higher up responsibilities and he doesn't go everywhere they go when they're called in before the king. Nevertheless, he's there in the city of Babylon, and she says, let me tell you about a man who told your father, that is your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, the interpretation of his dreams. This is a man who has the blessing of the gods. Her very words would lend us to believe she surely is not a believer in the true and living God, but she believes there's something special about Daniel. That he has the ability to communicate with the gods. And she tells him, call this Daniel in. He's the one that your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar renamed Belteshazzar. It's interesting, Belshazzar and Belteshazzar sound a whole lot alike, and it's because both of them the names are, the root word of the name is one of the Babylonian gods, Bel, B-E-L. Bel was just another name for the Babylonian god Marduk that we talked about in Daniel chapter number 2 when we saw that statue that Nebuchadnezzar had built that he wanted everybody to bow down and worship. So the god Marduk, or Bel, is the basis for both their names. Daniel's name Belteshazzar that was given to him by Nebuchadnezzar means Bel's prince or the prince of Bel. Again, going back to that idea that they were wanting these Jewish young men to abandon their own culture and their own gods and associate themselves with the Babylonian culture. Babylonian gods. Forget their old ways and become good Babylonians and worship Babylonian gods hence the name Belteshazzar. But we see here that all throughout the book of Daniel, Daniel is still being called Daniel. They tried to change his name, but apparently it never took with Daniel. He still called himself Daniel. And the queen mother is referring to him as Daniel also. The world tries to change us. We ought to be like Daniel. We ought to resist the world's effort to change who we are. And who our God is. Belshazzar, by the way, his name means Bel is the king's protector. Boy, that's an ironic name considering what's happening right now in the story. Bel, the false god of Babylon, is the king's protector. Is what his name means, Belshazzar. We're going to see how good a job Bel or Marduk does in protecting the king. I suspect, Brother Vinny, it's not going to be as, as good as he might have hoped for. Where am I at? Thirteen. Thirteen. Thank you, brother. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art the children, uh, art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and thou shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. So he's offering to Daniel the same thing he offered to the rest of the wise men, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans, 
and the astrologers, even though they couldn't interpret it. But Daniel's been brought in. The one who interpreted his grandfather's dreams. I imagine Belshazzar was waiting. I imagine the uh, anticipation of finding out what this means. It was beginning to get a little bit anxious in the room. Are you beginning to be a little anxious wanting to know what it meant to? Well, we're going to have to wait until next time because my time is up tonight. So we'll have to look at that the next time. His knees will still be knocking when we return the next time. Brother Vinny, would you ask the Lord to dismiss us tonight, please?